Plants belong to another universe, a silent and seemingly simple world. They make food from sunshine, which in turn feeds the animal kingdom. But what if plants were keeping something from us? What if they have minds? What if they are intelligent? Scientists are asking these very questions. Do they perceive their environment? Do they have a memory? Could they have a nervous system? To these men and women, the great divide between the plant and animal world is not that great at all. Our investigation into the mind of plants begins with a mystery, a murder mystery. In the late 1980s, a serial killer was stalking the Limpopo savanna. At the time, there was a severe drought. The country was devastated, water holes had dried up, and food became scarce. Only the tough and widely spread acacia provided any sign of hope to large herbivores, such as the kudu. These beautiful and robust animals could nibble around the tree's defensive spikes, plucking its small green leaves. Death by starvation seemed averted. The hard times could be survived. But then something strange began to happen. Large numbers of healthy kudus suddenly dropped dead. Thousands littered the landscape. The deaths continued for months with no clues as to why. The kudus lived on game reserves and were an important source of income to their owners and the tourist industry. The cost was high for both animals and people. It's very distressful to me to, to see such beautiful animals just lying dead for no reason. So I decided um, I've got the time and I've, I'm going to find out what it is. I found another dead kudu. We've lost 34 kudus. And the strange thing is that they, they die and they don't look bad. Uh, we were very worried at that stage on, on this situation there. Um, and that's why we've spent the money to try and determine, because the autopsies are expensive. The veterinarian, through the autopsy, couldn't say anything. He couldn't find anything wrong with the animal. Uh, he said we, he made a suggestion we should actually look further into the, into the process and see if we can't get any university involved. The job of detective fell on this man, Wouter van Hoven a distinguished conservation biologist and specialist in great African herbivores. The thing that was the most puzzling in this whole thing of kudus is that there were mortalities on certain ranches, but on other ranches there was no mortalities. And, and you know, we couldn't understand this because, you know, game ranches are fenced in, and the ranches are very much similar. Some ranches they die, some ranches they don't die. So then we started making a survey, and what we found is that there's a direct relationship between the number of kudu on the ranch per unit of size and the number of mortalities. So mortality was density related. It wasn't much to go on. The more the kudu stayed as a group, the more chance they had of dying. It was clear that predators did not kill them. There were no obvious marks on their bodies. Finding the cause of deaths would need further investigation. Van Hoven arrived with a fully equipped mobile lab and a team of students to help him carry out a series of autopsies. I looked at some of them post-mortem because we couldn't find any diseases, parasites, nothing of that. Van Hoven then focused his research on the dead animal's stomach content. 
kudus digest their food in a way similar to cows, needing the natural fermentation process to help it break down plant matter. The first post-mortem analyses showed something very odd. I looked at the intestines and particularly in the rumen and had a look at the efficiency of fermentation, the rate of fermentation. And that was the next clue, that on the farm where the animals died, the, the rate of fermentation was lower than the neighbor which had less kudu and there was no mortalities on his farm. Something was influencing the rate of fermentation. Now what could that possibly be? As the research continued, they found something even stranger. All the dead kudus had unusually high doses of tannin in their bodies. Tannins are molecules that some plants use as a chemical defense to fight off parasites and leaf-eating insects. Plants normally only produce small quantities of tannin, and large herbivores can just flush this low toxin out of their system through the liver. But the tannin levels were far too high for the kudus to handle, resulting in the slowing down of the fermentation process and the animal's ability to digest its food, with fatal consequences. The deadly tannin had to come from plants, as it only occurs naturally in them. But which ones? And how or why would any plant produce enough tannin to kill animals on such a massive scale? We shouldn't be too surprised to hear that plants kill animals. Unwary creatures can find themselves in an upside-down world where what they normally eat, eats them. Carnivorous plants have evolved elaborate traps, some with sticky fingers. Others have snapping jaws or slippery slides to catch prey. This is how they've adapted to living in poor soil and compensate for nutritional deficiencies. They've even pushed the limits of refinement by growing their sexual organs far from their stomachs in order to spare pollinating insects. Jean-Jacques Labatte is a specialist in carnivorous plants. His collection in southwest France is unique in Europe. There are about 650 species of carnivorous plants throughout the world. The only places where you won't find them are the poles and deserts. The most fascinating of them is the Darlingtonia. The Darlingtonia, also called the cobra lily, has evolved remarkable urn or trumpet-shaped traps. These urns, which stick out like cobra heads, have an appendage shaped like a mustache or a forked tongue. An insect is attracted by the color and nectar. It lands on the plant and climbs up the length of the tongue. It comes to a hole underneath the dome. Feeding on the nectar, the insect loses its footing and falls to the bottom. There's no water at the bottom, so it will take off again. And there, look, it, it's fantastic. False windows due to different thicknesses of its cell walls. The insect believes that the light shows him the way out, and for hours it will bump into those fake windows. It will never find the exit that is actually under its feet. After a while, the exhausted insect falls to the bottom where the plant slowly digests it. A brilliant strategy from the plant world. Carnivorous plants are the exception to the rule. In general, the question of who is superior is simply answered, and the line between the two worlds is clear. Plants make their own food using sunlight through a process called photosynthesis, while the animal world feeds on them. We don't just classify plants by the way they make food, but also by movement. Plants are fixed, whereas animals run, crawl, swim, or fly to feed. Yet in the world of single-celled organisms, 
This line is blurred. Some can act as both an animal and a plant, hunt for food, and use photosynthesis. Today, biologists believe that plants don't share the same evolutionary origins, separating mushrooms, mosses, and others into different kingdoms. Botanist professor Francis Halle specializes in the structure of trees and the ecology of tropical rainforests. For Professor Halle, the world of plants is a misunderstood kingdom full of wondrous treasures. The Americans have sequenced human DNA, 26,000 genes. The problem is that a few years later, we sequenced the genome of rice, 50,000 genes. But that gave us a cold chill, and many biologists thought we would have to abandon the idea that the more genes an organism had, the more evolved it was. Axel Kahn, a colleague and human genome geneticist, told us, no, don't drop this idea. The more a living creature evolves, the more genes it has. This simply proves that rice is more evolved than us. Try spending all winter with your feet in cold water, feeding only from the sun's rays and carbon dioxide. Well, you couldn't. And the reason is that you don't have the right genetic equipment. You don't have enough genes. Plants and animals are not in a race. We can't say that plants have overtaken us. In reality, it's a strange kind of race, because one goes left and the other goes right. Their strategies are inverse. So now we have to recognize that on their journey, plants have gone much further than we have on ours. Plants and animals have evolved alongside one another. Plants may feed animals, but in return, they ask to be pollinated and have their seeds dispersed. They've developed an arsenal of biological weapons to protect themselves, but they've also created a treasure trove of seductive powers. Their variety, beauty, and perfumes are compensation for an adult life fixed to the ground. Their only fleeting moment of freedom are as seedlings, falling to the ground or floating through the air. They've learned and mastered some important rules of survival, adaptation and cooperation. It's quite easy to say that uh, thanks to evolution, the, the living systems become uh, more and more clever uh, or more and more intelligent, while intelligence could be defined in, uh, in various ways. We generally consider intelligence as a combination of things. The perception of our environment and the ability to react to it. Having a memory, being able to communicate, interact socially, and having a brain to coordinate it all. Worldwide, a small group of scientists are at the forefront of this controversial branch of science. The University of Bonn in Germany is a leader in the research of plant intelligence. Here they're exploring one of the fundamental qualities for intelligence, the ability to perceive the environment. The results we had last year, combined with the work of our colleagues, have shown that plants can interact in many different ways with their environment. Professor Volkmann conducts his experiments using simple techniques to unlock the secrets of plant perception and intelligence.
There are several plants like pea and beans uh, developing tendrils uh, to find some support to come up to the light and to the air. We are using pea plants uh, like this. Here we have two pea plants. And when we are stimulating these tendrils in such a way by a wooden stick three, four or five times, uh, then these tendrils will move and respond in direction of uh, the stick in spite of the fact that we removed this stick. The pea plant's outer surface is covered with sensors that send a signal to the cells below. The stimulated cells grow less rapidly than the outer ones, causing it to twist around whatever it touches. This is what allows the pea plant to grow in all directions, stretching out, feeling the world around it, grabbing hold, creating the foundations for the rest of the plant to follow. Plants sense their environment. This is true of growing pea plants as it is of their flesh-eating cousins. Carnivorous plants are a little more complex. To ensure the plant captures something edible, the insect must first activate two fine hairs inside the trap before it closed. Another fast-moving plant is the sensitive. Water pressure against the cell walls keeps its leaves stiff. When it's pinched or stroked, the water pressure drops and the plant quickly sags. The exact reason why is not known, but the sudden movement from a touch could be a defense mechanism, frightening insects that land on it. Fast-moving plants are uncommon. We mostly see them as static, but this is only because we look at them through human time. What are the animals that live the longest? I think it's the giant turtles. They live three centuries. This seems a long time to us, but for a plant, it's no time at all. There are millions of 3,000-year-old plants. They can live much longer than that. For example, a protocea from Tasmania, the King's Holly, can live for 43,000 years. And in fact, this plant is in its youth and has no intention of dying. All this is to say that time runs differently for plants than for animals. Scientific studies about plants began less than 100 years ago. In the 1920s, Indian botanist Jagadish Chandra Bose tried to show that plants not only had sensations, but some kind of consciousness. He was well ahead of his time, using electricity to stimulate plants. He launched pioneering research into plant growth and plant reaction to electromagnetic waves. <laughs> In the 1970s, Soviet researchers flirted with sensitive plants. The results were spectacular. In their experiments, they managed to anesthetize plants with chloroform, stimulate them with candles, or, as in the famous experiments with frogs' legs, submit leaves to electrical pulses to get a reaction. Electricity, touching, fire, chloroform. These are sensations we could imagine affecting a plant. But what about sound? The Desmodium gerunce is commonly known as the dancing plant, in the strict sense of the word. If you make a noise, you'll see the leaves of this plant move incessantly. But you know, if you touch it, instead of making a sound, it doesn't move at all. Actually, it's sound that it's sensitive to. They like people to, to sing a song to them. 
they like to hear the nicely speech from the people, not from the artificial sound, like uh, from uh, e electronic sound. They like to play with two men. So for us scientists, this is a great problem. For two reasons. Firstly, because we don't know how it works. Secondly, and this is perhaps worse, we don't know what it's for. I find this very curious. A plant that makes itself noticed by moving. A predator, a herbivore, a deer or a horse would see it more if it moved rather than not moving. So there is a real mystery surrounding this plant. The dancing plant seems to break all the rules. In the early 70s, at the beginning of the hippie movement, a crazy idea took root. Some people claim that music had a beneficial effect on plants. In doubtful but original experiments, plants were exposed to different styles of music. Jazz or classical music made them grow stronger, while rock music killed them. The musician Roger Roger even composed music specifically for plants. It was called Rhapsody in Green and was meant to help plants grow and bear fruit. While the dancing plant reacts to sound, the effect of different musical styles is not something that scientists take very seriously at all. Because science is about facts and supporting evidence. So back on the crime scene, Van Hoven was searching for both. The pressure was on. The number of dead kudus was climbing. He had to solve this mystery. Van Hoven and his team of science detectives had two important clues. First, the deaths happened when kudus were in dense groups. And second, Tannen was the killer, and that had to come from a plant. Their plan was to see if a plant could sense the presence of a dense number of animals. For the purpose of the experiment, they became a gang of ravenous kudus. We then started looking at the tannin content of the same trees. We used acacias, several species of acacias, and we took the leaves, extracted the tannin, and measured the tannin content. And it was very clear that the tannin was, was up to four times higher on the ranches where there was a lot of browse, a lot of eating of, of, this, uh, of the cages. So that means the tree responds to over-utilization because the trees protect themselves. That's chemical defense. They don't want to be eaten all their leaves because then they're going to die. The tree that everyone thought was saving the kudu's lives throughout the terrible drought turned out to be the killer. But another mystery soon emerged. Even the acacias, untouched by the kudus, had an increased concentration of tannin in their leaves. Van Hoven thought there might be something in the air. First we pulled off the leaves and opened up all the little uh, pieces of the branches. So we put the bag over and left it there for about an hour. Then we took the bag off and now we got the air in which they, there was also then release of gas from the plant itself. And we take a sample of this air and that will be then analyzed back in the, in, in the main lab. What they quickly found was that as soon as kudus start overgrazing an acacia, the tree emitted a gas, ethylene. Ethylene, when it is liberated out of these stems, it goes normally downwind because it's a very light gas, CH2, CH2. It's a small, colorless, odorless uh, uh, gas. 
But when it gets to other intact leaves, it affects the mitochondria, and the mitochondria then produces the enzymes that catalyze the production for more talents. It's a chemical communication. The mystery was solved. The acacias not only sense the presence of large number of kudus, but their unseen communication system is what helped doom the large numbers of kudu grazing on the plants. If you want to manage wildlife, look at the lessons that nature learns you, teaches you, and uh, manage according to that. Ranchers in the Limpopo savanna are now more respectful of the acacia, making sure that their properties are not overpopulated with kudu. Cases like the acacia have scientists now talking about plants having social skills. The oak is another example of trees acting as a community. They can perceive the space around them. If a sapling from another species tries to take root in their territory, the oaks launch a chemical attack, killing the young intruder. We see forests as places of peace and calm, yet they have a surprisingly active and dynamic social life. The way trees communicate is similar to some highly social insects, such as ants. They'll leave chemical trails for others to follow, creating an invisible highway. And when the colony is under attack, soldier ants will release formic acid to warn the others. When plants are stimulated by the outside world, their metabolism changes. And this information is communicated through chemistry. A plant's going to react on nutrients that is transported by fluid, by water, through the root system. It's going to react on light that is the stimulus for um, photosynthesis, and it's going to react on damage and infections. So if you've got damage by eating or infections by plant viruses, you break down plant tissues and the plants react on that. They immediately produce uh, some kind of antibodies and they start reacting against that. It's in the human body, you find the same thing. The chemistry that plants use to communicate is complex. Japan is in the forefront of this research. Japanese people and Asian people in general have an insatiable curiosity for plants and animals, for all life around us. This is particularly true in Japan where the feeling that we are part of nature is very strong. Japan sees unlocking the secrets of the natural world as a source of innovation and prosperity for the future. The Laboratory of Plant Physiology at Tohoku University is well equipped to study the structural biochemistry of plants. They hope to find out how plants function at the molecular level. So far, they have achieved more than the Soviets ever did in the 1970s. Amongst their experiments, they are asking, how do plants sleep? Do they need sleep? And what happens if they don't? It's common to see these scientists taking their plants out for a morning stroll moving their prized specimen from one artificial location to another. Uh, this room is called the Artificial Climate Reproduction Room, where we recreate day and night in a 24-hour cycle. Here we have three plants on which we experiment with things like movement and sleep. 
These three plants are called Albizia, Senna, and Cassia. I'm currently working on this plant, the Cassia. All uh, animals and all plants and all organisms have a biological clock. That is common for all uh, organisms. Thus, the uh, sleep is not only uh, the task of the animals. And uh, some of plants uh, sleep very similar fashion as human beings. That is the uh, uh, leguminous plants. It's 6 p.m. The light is fading. It's time to see how some plants sleep. The albizia, a plant of the leguminous family, folds its leaves at night. It sleeps. This leaf movement, which we call falling asleep, occurs over a 24-hour cycle. These leaves that are now open, because it's day, will close at night. In the laboratory, Professor Minoru Ueda and his colleagues sometimes inflict a rather severe treatment on their plants. Leaves are cut, crushed, and ground to extract the molecule thought to be responsible for triggering sleep in plants. First, I extract the plant's secretion. This process takes about a week. I then purify the extract using a centrifuge. I repeat this process several times. Finally, I end with a pure substance. The plants are then subjected to the purified extracts and their reactions studied. The results are the following. Here we've added potassium chelidonate, and here we've only added water. Where we've added potassium chelidonate, the plant closes itself down and its leaves are in a state of sleep. But where we've added water, the plants remain the same, its leaves remain open. So we can actually see that the chemical substance controls the process of falling asleep. They've found the key compound that the plant uses to tell itself that it's time to sleep. By using the same compound in a concentrated form, they can speed up the plant's reaction. What happens if you deny plants sleep? Could they be like us, needing sleep to regenerate their bodies and their minds? If the natural process of sleep is prevented, then after two weeks the plant starts to turn yellow. It then withers and in the end the plant dies. We cannot draw any conclusions. The experiment was inconclusive as to whether the plant died as a result of hygrometry dysfunction because its biological clock was disturbed. We still don't really understand why plants need sleep. Experiments in Germany and Japan show that plants react to the outside world and communicate through chemistry. The acacia and oak have even used it to develop social skills. If we accept these abilities in plants, then we have to ask if plants have another essential criteria for intelligence. Like memory, being able to retain and recall an event, and learn from it. If we take the case of the dancing plant, then there is little doubt that plants have memory. 
Si vous prenez une plante qui danse dans la nature, if you take a dancing plant from the wild that's never had the opportunity to dance because it's too young or came from a quiet area and try to make it dance, then it doesn't do it very well. It moves a little bit, but clearly doesn't do what you'd like it to do. But then, train it to dance, day after day, and you'll be surprised to find that day after day it will dance a little better, to the point where it becomes an exceptional ballerina, and it will stay that way. This plant is capable of something that sports people would call training, and that is based on memory. In Germany, Professor Volkmann has found that pea seedlings have the capacity for memory. Here we have two pea plants, and we like to investigate if they have a memory and how long this memory is lasting. Professor Volkmann puts the seedlings in a horizontal position. Up is no longer up, but sideways. If the plants were left in this position, they would work out where up is and start growing in a new direction. The root system of some algae works in a similar way. The filaments responsible for keeping the plant in balance are transparent, so the effect can be clearly seen under the microscope. The trap granules are called statolites, and they are made up of minerals, and being heavier, tell the plant which way is down. We have a similar system in the ear to help us keep our balance. After 30 minutes, Professor Volkman cools the seedlings down to four degrees Celsius, putting them in a suspended state of animation. He wants to see if they'll remember having been put on their sides. After several days, the young peas are taken out of the refrigerator and brought back to room temperature to wake up. So, after warming up the temperature from 4 degrees in the refrigerator to 22 degrees in the laboratory, we see nicely the response of uh, both plants. Uh, they know exactly where up and down was. They remember their stimulation before the weekend, so at least four to five days. And we see that the response is a little bit different between the two plants which means the one is better with their remembrance, with their memory, than this one. The experiment shows that plants have a perception and memory of the space around them. A dancing plant can be trained building on previous experience. A carnivorous plant will retain the memory of a specific insect's touch for a short time in case another is nearby. The acacia will remember the kudu's overgrazing for over an hour. Plants have developed ways to store memory different to ours in a way that we don't as yet fully understand. It has allowed them to learn from the past, plan for the future, and work together for the benefit of the species. The word memory has been used for many different systems. We speak of human memory and we speak of computer memory, which is not the same thing. We speak of memory for the inferior animals. In that case, it's yet another system. And we can even speak of memory for plants, as different authors and scientists have done. What we mean by memory is the capability to store a certain signal for a certain period of time. And in some experiments, the capability to recall that signal with another signal. It's difficult for us to imagine that memory can be stored outside a brain. Could plants have some kind of central nervous system that we don't quite understand? And if so, where would it be? An audacious idea was proposed in the late 1800s. 
to understand its origins, we need to use our own memories and go back to where it started. Back to Victorian England and the great biologist Charles Darwin. Darwin's theories on the evolution of species revolutionized the field of biology and changed the way we look at our place in the animal kingdom. But Darwin's contribution to science was much more. In his country retreat in Kent, Darwin experimented on carnivorous and climbing plants. He put forth a daring idea that plant activity was not limited to growth. Charles Darwin, in his book, speculated on the possibility of there being a root brain. Because in Darwin's um, formulation, uh, the brain was associated with bending movements of roots. We had discovered a special zone just behind the root tip, which seemed to suggest that this uh, region has really some extraordinary physiology in there. Charles Darwin turned the scientific community on its head, and his writings still resonate today. Darwin started with the fact that plants feed through their roots, just like the head of an animal. A plant's roots would act as a central nervous system. This is what we call root brains theory. The plant keeps its head in the ground and displays its sexual organs to the outside world. At Bonn University, František Beluska, an advocate of root brain theory, has been working for several years on the physiological functioning of roots. Okay, so these are the seedlings, in one. Mm -hmm. really so the plants are extremely sensitive, although they don't look like to be sensitive, but even any small mechanical stimuli, immediately plants react. They initiate chemical, physical, and even electrical responses, and they screen continuously at least 20 different parameters from environment, and they need to integrate this information all the time in order to be able to adapt. František Paluska has developed special techniques to observe and capture plants in action. So, in the first movie, we will see a root with intact root cap. A root is growing up the slope uh, with a swarm-like behavior trying to find a weak place in the substrate. Uh, this is not just like very rapid movement. This all, whole sequence takes some 24 hours and each this touchdown movement is in fact taking some two, three hours during which the root apex is trying to grow down the gravity vector. Under the camera, a root wriggles like a worm, but it's a different story when its cap is cut. The second movie, we see two situations. The lower one is an intact root with a root cap and the upper part upper root is without root cap and you will see very nicely that the upper root is not able to perform this worm-like behavior because it is lacking the root cap. The decapped root is growing even faster as a control root but without any abilities to search for the weakest point so it will grow just directly straight in line. In the 1990s, researchers at the University of Bonn discovered unusual activity in a particular part of the root that they dubbed the zone of transition. Here they found cells containing molecules such as lactin and myosine. 
The fascinating thing about these molecules is that they are the same found in muscle cells that enable animals to move. The cells in the zone of transition may be very different, but they function in the same way as synapse, the nerve connections in animals that allow neurons in the brain to create circuits with other neurons, as well as muscle and gland cells. It's these synapse connections between cells that allow the complex interchange of information in our bodies, as well as perception, memory, and thought. Plants know when to go to flowering or where, when to go to dormancy. These are very critical decisions for the plant, and the whole plant body must react simultaneously. So there must be some system, some central commander in the plant, which decides when to start this process. Current research in plant physiology confirms Darwin's intuitions and ideas. The root system is not only used to feed, but it explores space with purpose and intelligence. The roots process complex information, much like the nervous system of vertebrates. If we look at how plants function and compare it to the animal world, it may not be as different as we'd like to think. If plants resemble us, and have a kind of nervous system, then is it possible to talk about plant neurobiology? This is a gray area that some biologists enter without hesitation. In Slovakia, scientists from all over the world gather to attend a symposium. They are not many in their field, and none of them would want to miss this event. Minora Ueda, Dieter Volkmann, and Franciszek Beluska all attend. They present their experiments and compare their views on a plant's nervous system. The concept of neurobiology, like the concept of intelligence, means many things to many people. The contradictions and the conflict are very interesting and fun to listen to, uh, perhaps bearing more on the other researchers than on the plant neurobiology group. These discussions are all part of a healthy debate that steers the scientists toward a greater insight into the world of plants. Scientists are quick to point out that plants do not have a brain or a nervous system. But at the same time, they will say that there are huge similarities at the structural and molecular levels with that of a vertebrate's nervous system. Cells may be very different, but they function very much like neurons and synapses that form circuits. The mechanics of how it's done may be different, but the results are almost identical. Plants need to perceive their environment and act intelligently to make the right choices in order to survive. So we can say that the difference between plants and animals, or at least between plants and inferior animals, is not that big when you really look at the cellular and molecular levels. These claims may seem reasonable, but the world of science is skeptic by nature. Uh, these days it is, of course, difficult because this field is still not officially accepted. So the mainstream is still not convinced about this idea. So in science it is uh, normal, it is uh, just usual. Science is very conservative and it takes a lot of time to make really breakthrough changes and advances. The journey of acceptance in science can sometimes be a long and arduous road. Fundamental research into plants can rattle conventional thinking. It sometimes embarrasses and disturbs. But it also opens our eyes and changes the way we look at the world of plants. In the scientific world of plants, I am absolutely convinced that the greatest discoveries are yet to come. We have much to learn from the natural world. The idea of plants having intelligence is a contradiction to our worldview. 
but at the same time, it is deeply consistent with the theory of evolution. All life has branched out from one center, rippling out, finding its own way to earn the right to live and pass on its genetic inheritance. What is true of animals is true of plants. There are superior plants, endowed with greater capability for perception, memory, and communication than others. In other words, with varying degrees of intelligent behavior. If we ask who is superior, animal or plant, then at least, in the Limpopo savanna, the answer is clear. The threatened acacia tree kills the starving kudu. And what if we went a little further and associated survival with intelligence, and we ask who will be around the longest? Then, the answer could be a little disconcerting. Thank you.